Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Michael Rubel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. It's a pleasure to be here today with Mark Wardman, author of Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power. We present this talk as part of our Alan S. Brown Scholar Series. Alan S. Brown proudly served his country as a U.S. Naval officer and was a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. In memory of his dedication to community and education, we present talks from renowned scholars and authors working in the field of American Jewish military history. Uh, this book is part of the Jewish Live series published by Yale University Press. Um, there's some really good books in that series and very readable, very enjoyable, including some others uh, related to our subject matter. There's a, a one on Hank Greenberg, the baseball great who served in World War II. There's a recent one on Judah Benjamin, the Confederate Secretary of State. But this is the first one that's, that's, that's right on the money for our story of, of Jews in the American military. And in many ways, uh, Admiral Rickover's story is, is our ultimate story, that someone who rose from the shuttle to the absolute top of the US Navy. And it's, you know, it's even more interesting that Rickover did it in many ways in what seems to be the exact opposite of what we think of as military style. He's, uh, he's one of the people that, that museum visitors ask about most frequently. They express uh, interest in his uh, amazing engineering accomplishments, the, the huge impact of the Nautilus, uh, also his reputation as, as, let's say, a difficult person. Uh, but what comes up probably the most question for us is, is whether he abandoned his Jewish identity or not, whether he converted to Christianity. And so it was great to see all of these things addressed in the book. Uh, for those watching on Zoom, we'll get to questions at the end. Please use the Q&A function uh, on, on Zoom and we will get to as many questions as we can. The chat is also open, but if you want your question and answer submitted in the Q&A. Uh, we have books for sale here for $26 and Mark will be available to sign and we will send out links for those of you online to buy the book. Uh, Mark Wardman is an independent historian and award-winning freelance journalist. His book include 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, The Divided America in a World of War, The Millionaire's Unit, The Aristocratic Flyboys Who Fought the Great War and Invented American Air Power, which is also now a documentary film, and The Bonfire, The Siege and Burning of Atlanta. His next book, The Greatest Capitals Who Ever Lived, Thomas Watson Jr. and the Epic Story of the Creation of America's Most Successful Industry will come out in 2023. Mark was born in St. Louis and grew up here in the Washington, D.C. area. Following college at Brown, he received a doctorate, doctorate in comparative literature from Princeton University. He lives with his family in New Haven, Connecticut, where he coaches lots of youth baseball. Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks to the museum. Uh, the museum is uh, a small but special place. Uh, it's a reminder that we are maybe small in number uh, as Jews, but we are mighty. And uh, perhaps uh, in American military history, there has never been one mightier than Hyman Rickover. Um, so this is a wonderful way to, I hope introduce him to wider audiences and for those who are aware of his, his legacy to sort of go into greater depth. Um, and uh, if we could have the first slide, please. Okay, so why did I title it Engineer of Power? So if we first, if we start, think about his, uh, his greatest uh, material accomplishment, you know, in the history of humanity, how many people can we say actually invented a new form of power? Uh, there is Prometheus of legend who discovered fire. Uh, I don't know who actually invented sail power. Somebody saw uh, a feather blowing in the wind. Uh, there are those who created uh, steam power. There was a series of inventors, but really after that, uh, we, are, we come down to one man, Hyman Rickover. And uh, you know, he was as tightly bound with his invention as anybody had who ever created anything. Uh, he created the nuclear reactor, something that 
prior to his coming along, nuclear reactors existed, but they existed as very large experimental beasts that were primarily used to generate fuel for bombs. And he took that idea uh, of uh, breaking down the kernel of the universe and putting it into a steel container uh, and uh, somehow managing to put it within hulls and powering ships. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary accomplishment. Um, but he was also somebody who was a master of power in political ways. Rickover was uh, a Jew from the shtetl, as Mike said. He managed to live, uh, to come to America. And despite multiple times in which his life could have been derailed, he managed within a Navy that reviled him and that he hated, he managed to remain in the Navy for 63 years, longer than anybody had ever served in the history of the United States. Uh, by the time he was done, he had been in the service from 1918, the end of World War I under Woodrow Wilson to 1981, the beginnings of the end of the Cold War in, uh, in no small part due to what he had accomplished under Ronald Reagan. It's an unmatched, unprecedented stretch. Uh, and he was a man that uh, President Carter, a nuclear submarine officer, uh, described as omnipotent, omniscient, and om uh, omnipresent. These were godlike qualities in the man. And yet within the Navy, the Navy thought of him as a terror within the Navy, as somebody who was breaking the Navy down, breaking it apart. Uh, if you look at the cover here, he is in a business suit. He is descending into a submarine. This is a, at that, at that point, he was at least a two-star admiral. This was simply not done. But Rickover was said that anybody can parade around in a uniform, that you could dress up a dummy to do that, he said. And he cared more about what he called a hierarchy of mind for which there was no rank and no and uniform did not matter. He banned saluting within his fiefdom, which was called naval reactors. Uh, a, uh, the lowest ranking person within it could argue with the highest ranking person within it. Uh, and again, this was not done within the Navy. So let's, uh, let's talk about his life. Let's go to the, first, uh, the next slide, please. So nobody was ever less likely to live the life he did. He came from a shtetl of about 4,700 Jews um, who lived north of Warsaw. Uh, it, virtually all of the Jews there were murdered by the Nazis in, in uh, 1942. So if we think about that, how many Rickovers were there within that small community that was eliminated? Um, he learned within that shtetl, hard study. He, attend, he was raised Orthodox there. Uh, he was, uh, he said he went to uh, school six days a week and on the Sabbath, they spent the entire day in synagogue. Uh, at age six, he came uh, in steerage to the United States. At the end of the voyage, a purser came up to his mother and said, you're going to need to send a telegram to your husband so that he can be there to greet you at Ellis Island. She gave him all the money that they had remaining. Uh, the money disappeared and the telegram seemed not to have ever reached her husband, whether it was a theft, whether something went awry, it's hard to say. They came off the ship at Ellis Island and an unaccompanied woman, she was with two children, could, uh, could not enter the United States. If we could see the next slide, please. And you can see over here uh, about midway through, 
this is their names, the Reichauers, uh, and there's Chaim Godalia Reichauer, uh, six years old. Next to their names, it's marked deported. They were literally slated within hours for being deported back to Europe from which they had fled. Um, and at the last minute, a, somebody from their, uh, their village of uh, Macau spotted them, happened to come for his own wife, spotted them, went back, got her husband, and he came and uh, brought them in from Ellis Island at the last moment. But you can imagine a six-year-old, he's been, uh, just made this perilous journey across uh, Europe. The Cossacks, as they called them, had uh, attacked their wagon as they were going uh, out of Poland. Uh, they were in, uh, in steerage, literally in the bottom of the ship on the way across. They got to Ellis Island and instead of being welcomed, they were told to wait and they waited and waited. And you can imagine what that ingrained into a six-year-old that perhaps his life here too was not going to be secure. Now, Rickover worked from age nine full-time. He uh, managed to find a job by lying about his age with Western Union that allowed him to work at night so that he could continue through high school. He did, especially for somebody who was uh, uh, working full time, he did quite well in high school, uh, but he had no realistic hopes of going to college. In fact, he was expected to uh, continue working full time and helping to support the family. Uh, when um, uh, somehow, by sheer luck, his cousin, who was living with them in, in their home in Chicago, where they moved to from New York, uh, was owed a favor by one of the donors to the local congressman. Uh, and that donor called in the chit. Uh, the congressman nominated Rickover uh, to the Naval Academy. Uh, Rickover studied like the devil to uh, pass the exam, passed just by a hair to get into Annapolis. And uh, if we could see the next slide. Uh, this is a picture from his uh, graduating year yearbook, 1922. Uh, he graduated in the top quarter of his class. Uh, there was not necessarily evidence of genius in, uh, in his performance. Although we have to be aware that back then in particular, the Naval Academy was primarily a, a preparatory school for ship command. So, and the parts of the ways in which that was prepared was that you marched, you paraded all the time. Rickover hated that, he hated it. He, uh, and he didn't believe in it. And he ended up uh, hating the Naval Academy. Uh, had a lot of bitter feelings about it his, his entire life. He studied like a dog. Uh, he studied out of hours, which was something not done at the Naval Academy. You were uh, considered to be a grind and uh, this was looked down upon. Uh, Rickover uh, uh, vowed if he ever had the chance, he was going to make changes at the Naval Academy. Um, now he faced, there were very small numbers of Jews at the Naval Academy at that time. There were about uh, 900 uh, students in his class. 17 of them started out uh, were uh, Jews. By the end, there were only 12. All Jews lived in what was called Coventry, Coventry in, at the Naval Academy at the time. And what that meant was silence. Unless necessary, none of the other midshipmen ever spoke a word to them. They were, there was a large uh, Episcopalian chapel at the center of the Naval Academy, at the center of uh, Naval Academy life. Jews were sent to worship off campus. Um, again, this was 
appointed which rick over by mistreatment by uh the feeling that he was uh not secure within this world that he started getting a massive chip on his shoulder and he, when he had the opportunity to make changes at the naval academy he did so thoroughly and the navy hated him for it we'll get to that now uh, after leaving the Naval Academy, Rick Over uh, met, uh, he went to Columbia University where he got an electrical engineering degree. And while there, he met a brilliant woman of uh, German descent, uh, not Jewish, uh, fell completely in love with her. He said she was the most brilliant woman, or rather not woman, the most brilliant person he had ever met. She was uh, a legal scholar, she was one of the first people to get a PhD in law. She uh, helped to lay the groundwork for what became the World Health Organization. She and Rick Over worked closely together and uh, they uh, wrote a number of publications together. Um, and uh, they led a very private life. Um, and if we could see the next picture, please. This is uh, Rick over with his son, Robert, their only child. Uh, I've had uh, several conversations with Robert about his father. He really uh, speaks of him with great affection. Um, but of course, he also grew up with a father who was uh, often away from home because he became a very, very busy man eventually. Um, even his son believed that he had converted to Episcopalian. Uh, but thanks to uh, Rabbi Bruce Kahn, who's with us today, uh, I've came to learn that indeed he had never converted. He maintained a very private Jewish existence, uh, and we can perhaps talk about that after the talk. Um, he was anything but a regular Navy officer. He and his wife never uh, socialized with anybody from the Navy. Uh, in fact, they, uh, when they had the opportunities, when he was uh, stationed overseas in the Philippines pre-war, they went off traveling at every opportunity they had throughout Southeast Asia. And they lived like students, even though they could have afforded better and were told, well, you're, you're colonials, go live like colonials. And they were out, there's a, a, a travelogue that his wife wrote that he published after her, her death uh, that includes this a photograph of him riding a water buffalo. And uh, they went to every exotic place you could imagine within uh, uh, Asia in the day. This was leading up to the period just when World War II was about to break out. Um, okay, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, Rick Over headed up uh, what was called the, the electrical section at, at the Navy Bureau of Ships. The electrical section was responsible for all of the electricity power systems uh, other than uh, that powered by electricity within ships. And you're talking during the Navy about uh, all together, including small boats, about 110,000 ships that were created during that period. Uh, it was an, uh, a huge responsibility. Um, and at, this was at uh, the old, uh, what was known as Maine Navy, uh, temporary buildings that were built along uh, the reflecting pool uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial uh, that have since been torn down, although I can remember them from when I was a child here, uh, looking uh, those sort of old, uh, buildings that ran all along Constitution and Independence Avenue. And, uh, so he developed during his time at, uh, heading up the electrical session, he developed his management style in which, uh, as I said, there were, he insisted the Navy regulation book did not come inside here. Uh, we are indifferent to rank. We're going to get the job done. Um, he also developed his style of fighting the chain of command, going around it, 
uh, in the Navy, you didn't do that. You went to your superior officer and then your superior officer had to go to the next officer and that superior officer had to go to the next officer all the way up until eventually whatever you were trying to accomplish down below, and he was way down below, uh, reached somebody who could actually act on it. Uh, and uh, Rick Over didn't understand that. And he started, uh, he would go around it and he would, uh, he made his superiors crazy, but he also got things done. And when you get things done, you can get away with an awful lot. And that sort of sent him along this pathway that would continue. He was a fighter. He would fight for what he wanted. If you opposed him, you had better be ready to fight back. And Rickover was a tough kid from the streets of Chicago and he would brawl intellectually uh, when he was at the Naval Academy physically uh, until he got his way. And he's, he said, this was part of my management style. He said, if you're going to oppose me, you had better be ready for a fight. And most people did not want to fight. You know, he was a, a true SOB and, uh, and was willing to go to any length to get his way. Um, this, he was also remarkably a deeply humane guy. So this is a picture of a school that he set up on Okinawa for local island children. Uh, he also, uh, after there was a terrible typhoon there, uh, he gave um, equipment to uh, local villagers to help them get back on their feet. Uh, but this was a very, very private side to him. He did not show this to others. Um, but at the end of World War II, the Navy was shrinking. The purpose of the Navy was even under challenge. Many people didn't know why, why do we need a Navy in a world with atomic weapons? What can a Navy do when aircraft carrying atomic weapons are the ultimate warfare that for which the Navy had no real answer? And the Navy was being steadily whittled away. Budgets were going to the new Air Force that was being created. If we could see the next slide, please. This is the bomb that incinerated Nagasaki. Prior to World War II, the Navy had already begun to explore the idea that you might be able to put nuclear fission, the breaking down of the nucleus of the atom, into a chamber that you could use to heat up uh, some kind of solution, that solution could possibly be used to exchange energy with another uh, water uh, circulating system. And that water circulating system could boil up steam and that steam could be used to power a turbine. But after World War II, if you think about the idea of this energy being put into a small chamber and that chamber being stuck between halls. I mean, on the surface of it, it's just insane. And you're, the idea that you could send something like that out into the oceans where there are 50 foot waves and under the sea where uh, the pressures are in, uh, intense enough to crush anything. And he was, or the Navy began, had a small program to begin to look into whether this was going to be possible. It, uh, the likelihood was that this was something uh, decades off. Nobody really believed that it was ever going to be practical, but it was worth uh, looking into. And there was a group, a Navy group that was created that went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, where the Man Manhattan Project had been centered uh, to study nuclear fission. Everything there had been directed towards making a bomb. Rick over and his group, and he quickly took over the group. He quickly took charge of the group and he did it 
by underhanded means. Rickover was always willing to do things underhanded to get his way. And we can talk about what that means. Uh, but he got charge of this group and they began the process of trying to figure out how to make a practical nuclear reactor. Uh, as I had said at the beginning, reactors up to that point were massive. They would have easily filled this room. The, uh, they were used to produce uh, materials for making more of these and the likelihood of arriving at a practical reactor seemed far distant. Rickover though, uh, through his studies became convinced that indeed it was possible. It was an engineering effort. It wasn't, it wasn't something that required deep academic science. It required engineers coming up with practical solution after practical solution to this problem. Uh, so Rickover began this process of trying to figure out how you could actually take fission and place it within a container. Now, um, if we could take a look at this next slide. So he, in this position, uh, eventually, uh, because he had accomplished what he had accomplished during World War II, there were people within the Navy who said, this is a man who can get things done. Let's give him some power. And that power was actually his hunting license, he said. And what they did was the new Atomic Energy Commission, what is today the Department of Energy, set up a Department of uh, Nuclear Propulsion or uh, Nuclear Reactors. And the Navy set up uh, a branch to focus on uh, naval reactors. And they put Rickover in charge of both. This was a dangerous thing to do <laughs> if, you, if uh, you knew the man because you have now given him uh, two hats. One hat, his civilian hat, he could write himself a memo saying, uh, I would like the Navy to fund this effort uh, on behalf of developing a nuclear reactor. And then he would answer himself by funding it. And uh, he would also write to his superiors and as uh, somebody from uh, the Atomic Energy Commission's office and say, it would be really embarrassing if the Atomic Energy Commission funds this project and the Navy does not do its part. And again, the Navy would feel obligated to, uh, to meet his demands. Uh, you can imagine, again, how uh, people within the Navy who thought that they should be the ones controlling uh, propulsion aboard ships felt about this guy who was developing nuclear reactors under their noses. And what he did uh, was in Idaho, out in the high deserts of Idaho, he uh, developed a land sub. And that land sub had within it the first nuclear reactor. Uh, and to get there required him to develop an entire new industry. None of this existed before him. They, uh, he had, at, at the time, there were, the US was producing about 83, 86 pounds of zirconium every year. You know, you have your zirconium bracelets and the like. Zirconium was an exceptional metal for shielding. It didn't allow uh, radiation to pass through it. And so he, but he needed tons, tons. And so he created an entire industry that took uh, what had previously cost in uh, the then dollars, about $3,000 a pound and brought it down to $50 a pound. Uh, he had to uh, develop nuclear chemistry to understand what happens when you, uh, when you radiate water or in, uh, other liquids and have it passing through a system. You know, does it break down? Does it, burn? Does it break down the, uh, the components within that system? And he had to figure out uh, what, what would happen within there. And then they had to figure out how to transfer heat across metal 
into that secondary circulatory system uh, without sending radiation across it. And he had to shield this whole thing so that it could be light enough to fit within a submarine hull uh, without becoming so heavy, so unwieldy that the submarine couldn't travel or would sink. Uh, this was an extraordinary thing to do. And he said, I'm going to do it all and have a submarine uh, go to sea or uh, launch in five years. Nobody believed this was possible. Nobody thought this was, was even uh, within the realm of possibility. Um, in 1953, this land submarine powered a propeller for the first time. This was the Kitty Hawk mo moment of the nuclear propulsion age. Uh, uh, at that moment, uh, just before, his engineers said, you know, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen when, when we power up. Um, maybe we should do this remotely. How about we set up a mile away from here? And he said, no, no. And then they said, well, how about we, we put the, uh, set up the controls right outside the hall? And he said, no. And they went inside the hall and they powered up. And uh, so from there, he knew it would work. And then not only that, they ran it for days on end. No, uh, the equivalent of running a submarine across the Atlantic. Prior to this, submarines were essentially surface ships. They ran on diesel motors along the surface. And while they were on the surface, it uh, charged up a battery. They had these mattress sized batteries within the hull. Uh, batteries that were very dangerous in themselves. Fires were frequent. Uh, it was, a, it was not, not a happy place to be on a submarine when there was a fire. Uh, when they went underwater, they could travel very slowly and only for a few hours. They were noisy. They were, uh, they were very easy to track. Uh, as the German U-boats found out during World War II, uh, eventually, they, uh, once the tracking technology was developed sufficiently, it was a quick way to death. The, the uh, submarine forces on both sides had the highest percentage of losses of, of any service branches in the military. And he was, so the idea was that you're going to put a reactor into a submarine and you're going to be able uh, to go under the sea and to stay down and to travel at full power and to do it continuously. This, this would be a revolution in naval affairs. And within two years, uh, he, so he promised Congress that he would get the Nautilus as the first submarine to sea by 1955. In January, 1955, if we could see the next slide. Well, this is Rick over demonstrating what the reactor would look like sort of in a, uh, in a um, sort of uh, uh, demonstration format. Um, and this was actually uh, the press taking notice of what he was doing. It was uh, such an extraordinary idea. Uh, he was getting uh, extensive press coverage. Life magazine uh, ran a story about this, the nuclear reactors in development. See the next slide, please. Um, and uh, soon he got the, uh, next slide. Uh, the then uh, ultimate imprimatur of importance by being on the cover of Time Magazine. Um, and through it all, the Navy continued to hate him. They hated him for his achievements. They hated him for his unwillingness to acknowledge naval traditions, naval rank, naval chain of command. And, in the, and perhaps they also hated him for his Jewishness. In the midst of all this, they tried to cashier him. 
in, in naval requirements are to be promoted. He was by that time a captain to be promoted to flag rank admiral. You have to pass a selection board. This is a, a board of your future peers of admirals who vote together on who will join their very small uh, elite leadership club. And twice he failed to get passed to admiral by the selection board. Under naval rules, twice without getting selected means you're out. They, uh, you are automatically forced to retire. In the history of the selection board system, nobody had ever failed twice and continued on. So he had friends. Uh, if we could see the next slide. Oh, uh, those friends in Congress said, what are you doing? You're in the midst of this largest project in naval history. And you're going to fire the man who's in charge of it. And he had friends like Scoop Jackson, uh, Mendel Rivers, Carl Vinson, uh, powerful men in Congress. A, uh, the successor to the Congressman who had nominated him to the Naval Academy, Sidney Yates, they protested and they put up a loud, loud noise. And they said, if the Navy doesn't promote him, we are going to take over your promotion system. And they withheld the promotion of uh, 29 captains at that moment. So the Navy, seeing the writing on the wall, convened another selection board. The selection board said specifically, we are looking for a captain with uh, experience in nuclear propulsion, uh, and uh, we, we are going to nominate one officer to flag rank. Uh, and Rickover said, they, uh, you know, they may as well have said that they're going to uh, promote a 125 pound Jew, um, and they promoted him to admiral. Uh, needless to say, this didn't win him friends within the service, but he had friends on Capitol Hill and they mattered a whole lot more. And what he accomplished mattered most of all. And he, he knew the value of public relations. Uh, he wanted to make sure that people knew about what he was doing. Um, and so uh, Eisenhower, who at that time was looking for ways to promote the idea that atoms could be something other than bombs, uh, you know, in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, he sent his wife, Mamie, to christen the, uh, the Nautilus. Uh, and, um, and that was in January 1954. Uh, while, uh, and if we could see the next slide, please. And there were uh, tens of thousands of people there watching it, the Nautilus side slide into the sea at uh, the electric boatyard. Uh, on the Thames in New London. Now, simultaneously with all this, as if he wasn't busy enough, if we could see the next slide, Rickover took a, the plans for a large ship reactor because they were also investigating what it would take to put a reactor into a ship. And he took the plans for a large ship reactor and the Eisenhower administration asked him to create the first atomic electric utility plant. And he, uh, this was the largest metal casting in the history of industry up until then. Uh, this reactor went into uh, what became the first uh, atomic power utility in shipping port, Pennsylvania, above Pittsburgh. In uh, 1957, uh, it began to illuminate uh, homes in Pittsburgh and continued to operate for another 40 years. Um, it became a university for the atomic power industry. Uh, but Rickover himself didn't get control of the atomic power industry. It was one of the few things that he couldn't manage to get control of. 
and he said that leaving it uh, in private hands was going to result in trouble. And indeed, uh, when Three Mile Island uh, happened, it decimated the atomic power industry. And they actually called in naval reactors to be observers in the committee that, uh, that reviewed what had taken place. And you'll notice that there hasn't been another uh, even close to uh, atomic power accident in the US utility system. Um, and in part, that's because uh, Rick Over's followers ended up heading up new boards that were set up to oversee the atomic power industry. Um, if we could see the next slide. So here's Rick Over as, as a, uh, a, a rear admiral. Um, as I said, although he, on the most ceremonial of occasions, although not when he was getting uh, medals pinned on him, he would uh, don his uniform, but it was a rare thing. Uh, the Navy disliked this man intensely. They disliked what he was accomplishing. They disliked uh, uh, how he was going about it. But they also knew that he was bringing a revolution to the Navy, a revolution that some didn't want, but a revolution that was necessary. And in January, 1955, the USS Nautilus sent back a message to shore underway on nuclear power. And in its first operations, the very first operations of, of its sea trials, it set all the world records for underseas operations, for diving, for, uh, uh, some, uh, for surfacing, for uh, tr uh, full power operation under, underwater. Nothing like that had ever been accomplished in a submarine before. They uh, eventually, uh, they uh, went from uh, New London down to the Caribbean, the entire way underwater on, on full power. There had never been a submarine that had done anything close to that before. Uh, in, uh, in 1958, August 1958, the Nautilus accomplished what had uh, something that had uh, entranced uh, mankind for as long as we had been aware of the Arctic ice, the polar ice cap. We could see the next slide, please. The Nautilus sailed under the polar ice from, one, uh, from uh, the Barents Sea off Alaska to uh, off Greenland, underwater the entire way. Uh, this was uh, a, in part a Cold War moment. This, uh, along with this extraordinary uh, technological achievement, this was the United States answer to Sputnik. The Soviet Union had launched rockets, satellites into orbit. The writing was on the wall. These rockets were perfectly capable of carrying uh, warheads that could target the United States. The US didn't have an answer to that. The closest thing that we had as an answer to it was, uh, was the Nautilus. Uh, this was our underwater satellite. Uh, and when this moment of celebration came for this extraordinary achievement, everybody who was involved with it was brought to the White House for a big press conference to make the announcement, except for one man, Rick Over. There was a, uh, an acting uh, chief of naval operations who uh, said that if I ever get the chance to meet Rick Over in a dark alley, uh, he's a goner. Well, this was his dark alley. He, he did not welcome Rick over to the stage there. Uh, word got out that Rick over had been snubbed. Congress went crazy. They uh, uh, gave him a, a second Legion of Merit award. Um, the uh, White House Eisenhower gave him his second star as an admiral. And once again, Rick overturned adversity into triumph. And this is actually the uh, Nautilus sailing into New York City uh, for a, a celebration. 
uh, with Rick over aboard, they went down the, uh, uh, the Avenue of Heroes in New York City with a quarter million people cheering and Rick Over was in the lead car as the, the uh, president's personal representative. Now, what this meant for the Cold War was extraordinary. This meant, as Rick Over said, we can now go where we want, when we want. The advent of rockets meant that you would eventually, took just a few years, be able to load rockets onto these ships. You had created a third arm of the triad, the air, land, and sea defense system. And you could send submarines, if they could go under the polar ice, they could get up right up against into Soviet waters. Soviets understood this. For the first time, they understood that to use nuclear weapons against the United States would be suicidal. Uh, today, we're dealing with a situation in which there's another uh, madman who is threatening that. But even a madman knows that you don't commit suicide not to your entire nation. So as a deterrent force, this was unmatched. And if we could see the next slide, please. That's John F. Kennedy watching a demonstration of a Polaris missile. Um, he was flabbergasted to see that. We now have at any one time about 60, uh, 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 boomers they're called, or uh, and attack submarines that are in rotation out in the sea. I've talked to many submarine captains who said, we knew where they were. They didn't know where we are. Um, that's in part thank, thanks to dampening technology, sound dampening technologies. But it is in the vastness of the sea, these submarines can be anywhere and there is no defense against them. And if you think about what the recent deal, the what was called AUKUS, Australia, UK, US, uh, for some, uh, providing uh, nuclear submarine technology to Australia uh, that created a lot of dust up because the French felt snubbed by this. Um, part of that is directly attributable to what Rickover accomplished 50 plus years ago. Um, Rick Over, of course, was not only interested in submarines, although submarines were really the uh, most extraordinary thing that, uh, that came out of this effort because you have now created an undersea satellite. These subs go to sea for uh, two months or more at a time on deployment. The, uh, they can be out at sea for as long as our food supply lasts. And if we could see the next slide. Eventually, the US launched the world's first nuclear, all nuclear task force, cruisers and uh, a, an aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise. The Enterprise uh, was the largest ship ever to go to sea. Uh, you can see the uh, formation of sailors there, uh, the E equals MC squared, um, what that meant prior to this, carriers were in part, uh, a, a large part of the underhaul uh, of the carrier was filled with diesel fuel in order to travel from one place to another. They needed to, uh, to uh, refuel frequently, often had to be slowed by a, an oiler uh, a fuel ship alongside. What atomic energy means for our now all nuclear carrier, uh, carrier fleet is that we can send a ship at full speed through any seas without having to go to port to refuel, without having to dawdle uh, to uh, take on fuel uh, because 
they have nuclear propulsion and they, uh, we can now uh, have this additional, uh, both tactical and street strategic uh, uh, platform to uh, send to crisis spots. And uh, believe me, there are carriers now uh, near Ukraine. There are also carrier, there's also a carrier uh, in the, uh, near the South China Sea. Um, so it is a, a responsive force uh, that uh, gives us an exceptional uh, ability to respond to crises when they arise. Now, before we get to this, um, in order to operate these vessels, these are not traditional vessels. These are vessels with nuclear power reactors inside them. You need to know how they work. You need to know what to do when something goes wrong because inevitably something is going to go wrong. These are complex machines, the most complex machines in history up to that point. And the Navy educated officers to run ships to drive ships, to be, uh, to command men. They didn't educate them to be nuclear engineers. And Rickover said, if we're sending these ships to sea, we have to have the personnel capable of operating them. And he wasn't getting them. He wasn't finding the people he wanted from the Naval Academy in particular. And so he forced through his friends in Congress, he forced a change. And he basically brought the revolution uh, that he was creating to the Naval Academy. He, uh, the Naval Academy today is considered one of the most foremost, uh, one of the foremost uh, engineering schools in the world, uh, a Naval MIT. Uh, and that's thanks to curriculum reform that Rickover forced upon it. Again, the Navy did not want this. But thanks to his friends in Congress and his need for qualified officers, he got his way. Um, now, he had a most peculiar way of choosing the people who are going to be officers on his ships. When they came in, there, they, uh, these midshipmen were bussed down from the Naval Academy to nuclear reactors first uh, at, at the, um, along the um, uh, reflecting pool in the old temporary buildings along the reflecting pool. And then in new Naval reactor offices uh, over in uh, Crystal City. Um, interestingly, when he moved to his new offices, they put in nice carpet, um, uh, nice furniture, and he told them, tear it all out. He said he did not want naval contractors coming in here and seeing him look like he had plush surroundings so that they could think they could take advantage of the taxpayers. Uh, these midshipmen were bussed down from Annapolis uh, for a candidacy in, uh, in naval reactor training, and he had set up a, a naval reactor training program. When they got there, they sat down on a chair and they immediately started sliding to the floor. He had cut the legs off in the front of the chair by a couple inches, so they were thrown immediately off balance. And then he started peppering them with questions. And these questions were everything from, uh, uh, you know, tell me about your sexual relations. Tell me about uh, your views on religion. You know, what are the last 10 books you read? Summarize them. Um, you know, what courses did you uh, most like? What did you take away from it? And they had to go, do quick, immediate summaries, uh, very short, very brisk. And if he didn't like what you said, he banished you to a broom closet. You know, the equivalent of, I don't know what's behind there, but behind that door. And you would sit there for hours and then stewing, thinking, and then you would be called back in. And he would ask the same question again. And if you failed to answer the way he wanted, you were banished again and would spend hours there. Now, uh, this sometimes he could get abusive. 
Uh, some of these stories may be apocryphal, uh, but uh, I know talking to people who've gone, th uh, th uh, who went through this, uh, some of the stories are certainly true. Somebody told me about a time that uh, uh, one of their fellow midshipmen was called in. Uh, he asked, what are your family plans? He said, do you have a fiance? And he said, yes. He said, are you going to have a lot of kids? And he said, yes. And then Rick over said, okay, you have a choice. You can either uh, be a family man or you can get into my program. What are you going to do? And so he pushed the phone across the table. He said, call your fiance now. And uh, midshipman picked it up, called her, broke things off, broke her heart, put the phone down. Rickover said, you're not in my program. Anybody who would do that, you can't be in my program. Uh, he would tell people, uh, do something to make me angry. What can you do to make me angry? In one case, somebody took uh, a, a, a beloved submarine model, went over to the window, tossed it down, smashed it into pieces. Sorry, thanks to uh, Bruce Kahn here. And uh, Rickover took him. Um, there are endless stories. He would do things that were abusive, in some cases, borderline illegal. Uh, he let people who came through his office know in uncertain terms, they were serving him. And if they got in, it was by his own graces. Uh, this letter uh, was not atypical. Uh, you can see, uh, I, uh, dear Admiral Rickover, I hereby spontaneously volunteer to lose 10 pounds by 8 September 1960. I further spontaneously volunteer not to regain the weight lost very respectfully. This was uh, by somebody coming into his program. He would have uh, the um, assistants in his office uh, come in when he thought somebody was overweight. He'd tell the uh, uh, midshipman, take your shirt off. He'd ask his assistant, is he fat? And if they said, yes, I think he, he could do with losing some weight. He said, go type up a letter for him. And they would, uh, if they wanted to be in the program, they would sign it and follow through. It was no question, abusive, no question, but he got away with it. Um, and through this control of personnel, he became both the stuff of legend and again, hated throughout the Navy, but he also took control of the Navy. He was a fourth echelon department head. And one chief of naval operations said to, uh, said to other officers, you guys may think I run the Navy, but I work for Rick like everybody else here. And he got, he held the Navy by the short hairs. Now, there were those when he had, who went through these, uh, uh, these, this interview process, uh, like Admiral El Elmo Zumwalt, future Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, a World War II hero who, uh, was, uh, who was banished to the broom closet several times and came back out and, and had never been so incensed in his life. You know, this is a dignified officer being considered for ship command. And he said, I don't want it. And he, when he became chief of naval operations in uh, later years, he and Rickover butted heads constantly, constantly. And then there were people like Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was a nuclear submarine officer or was uh, a candidate to become a nuclear submarine officer. He had done exceptionally well at the Naval Academy. Uh, they talked, he and Rickover talked about, you know, operas. They talked about uh, some of their favorite books. And then, um, uh, at the end, Rick Overs looked at his uh, transcript, you know, which was largely uh, all A's except for maybe a few B's. And, and Rick Overs said, um, so did you always do your best? And uh, Carter thought about it for a, a few seconds. And then he said, he had to admit, no, not always. And Rick Overs said, why not? Turned his back on him. And Carter got in, but that moment stayed with him for the rest of his life. He said, no man ever had more impact on my life other than my father. 
and he titled his campaign autobiography, uh, Why Not the Best? Because of that question from Rickover. Now, um, Rickover could get away with all of this because as we can see in this next slide, he had friends on the Hill. You know, uh, Leverett Saltonstall, Hubert Humphrey, uh, Lyndon Johnson, you can see here. Uh, these Scoop Jackson, these were uh, people of tremendous power and they loved Rickover. And every year he would come up to Capitol Hill and he would testify and he would berate the Navy and he would berate the Defense Department. And he would say, what are we doing with this bureaucracy? You know, if the Navy had its way, we would still be sailing. Uh, and um, on Capitol Hill, they loved him. McNamara and the Defense Department threatened to court martial him. He refused when he testified, he wouldn't wear his uniform. It's mandatory that if you testify uh, from the Navy that you wear your uniform. Uh, McNamara, when he threatened to court martial him, went to see uh, Mendel Rivers, tremendously powerful congressman from South Carolina. And Rivers looked at him when, uh, rec, uh, when McNamara said he was gonna court martial and he said, well, um, you know, you'll have all the Jews and you'll have all the Catholics and probably all the Protestants and you'll have all of Congress opposed to you and probably all the American people too. But if you feel like doing that, you just go ahead. And McNamara turned his heels and headed out of the office. And of course he did not. Now, eventually, Rickover's power extended to the highest office in the land. See the next slide, please. He went to see John Kennedy. And what did they talk about? They talked about education. Rickover wrote uh, multiple books on education, what he saw going on with the Naval Academy. He extended through uh, to the entire American education system. He believed we were falling behind. He said uh, to be undereducated in a trigger happy world is to invite catastrophe. That's never been truer. Uh, and uh, Rick Overs pushed hard for improvements in STEM education for the establishment of rigorous standards, uh, uh, the creation of a, of a national education department that could uh, enforce those standards. Uh, and eventually uh, much of what he advocated came true. Now, uh, the apotheosis of Rickover's power, if we could see the next slide, came when a nuclear submarine officer was in the White House. Jimmy Carter uh, invited Rickover, I've seen notes from before he ran for president, he invited him to be an advisor. And Rickover became a confidant, uh, a mentor. And he was welcomed in the White House when everyone uh, uh, the Carters came to the Rickover's apartment. This is the second Mrs. Rickover. Uh, Rickover's first wife died of a heart attack. Uh, he was distraught, heartbroken. A few years later, he met a nurse, uh, Eleanor, uh, who became his, his companion, his wife for the rest of his life. And again, we can talk a little bit about her at the end. Um, Rickover, was uh, advised Carter on speeches. Uh, he uh, talked to him about anything. Carter said, you can talk to me about anything except the Navy budget. Rickover was still pushing to nuclearize uh, the Navy. Uh, Carter was wanted um, uh, conventional powered carriers. Um, and Carter, uh, when uh, he went out, if we could see the next slide, uh, on the, the uh, Los Angeles with uh, Rickover uh, said, this is the greatest enge engineering achievement in human history. Um, now, that wave that Rickover was riding crashed. Um, in uh, 1980, uh, Reagan defeated Carter for president uh, and the secretary of the Navy John Lehman, who was literally half Rickover's age at that point, said that his first order of business was to retire Rickover. He said he ran a commissariat, he had a Gestapo-like grip on the Navy, uh, that he uh, disobeyed the chain of command, and that this 
uh, was destroying the Navy. Um, Rickover said that Lehman was in the pocket of the contractors. Rickover was in a constant fight with the contractors about uh, cost overruns. And he said they were fleecing the taxpayer. Uh, there was a fierce final battle in the Oval, Oval Office uh, uh, that is jaw dropping. When you read it, you'll see. Um, and Lehman won. Uh, if we could see the next slide. That's uh, Lehman behind Rickover. You can see he's looking there with killer eyes. Uh, so that ended Rickover's career after 63 years. Uh, there was, if we could see the next slide, um, he was celebrated in a variety of ways, uh, including a Rickover submarine number 709, uh, a fast attack Los Angeles class submarine that was named in his honor, commissioned in 1984. He died in July of 1986. Uh, he's buried over in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, there's actually an incorrect birth date, which when you read my book, uh, you'll see why that's incorrect and why that mattered. It actually mattered. Uh, and we can see the next slide. Uh, there is a new Rickover, the uh, uh, 795, uh, that was christened at electric, electric Boat uh, last summer. Um, and it still ha will have the same mission to defend our country and prevent war. Uh, and what I'm gonna do now is end with a quote from him. Um, and if we could see the next slide, please. Rickover was something of a philosopher admiral. He gave lectures, he uh, wrote essays, um, unfortunately, they haven't been collected except for what he wrote about education uh, that he published himself. What he said, this is one of his famous quotes. He said, responsibility is a unique concept. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden to someone else. Unless you can point your finger at the man who is responsible when something goes wrong, then you have never had anyone really responsible. Rick Over took responsibility for everything he did in life. Thank you. I apologize for running on here. Do we have uh, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, as I have had the pleasure creating Jewish war veterans and have met many nuclear sub engineers mm -hmm. are especially in the metropolitan area mm -hmm. and they all have their stories their interview stories which yeah. is a laugh uh -huh. I've collected several but do you have an example of his uh, despite his mal adaptations on some example of him really working hard just working hard uh so the, uh, the I, I'll repeat the question for the uh, home audience. Uh, so uh, we have a gentleman here who knows many, um, who's a Jewish war veteran himself, who knows many nuclear submarine officers uh, who live in the Washington DC area. Um, and all of, most of whom have uh, their own anecdotes about Rickover. And he asked, do I have uh, stories about Rickover working hard? You know, Rickover worked hard all the time. Rickover worked, if you worked at naval reactors, you knew that you worked six days a week. Those were normal working hours. And that in some cases you would be in on Sunday. Rickover started uh, when he, he was building, he would start his week usually Sunday night he would travel to, uh, if he was going to Chicago, he would travel to Chicago, and then he would spend part of his day in Chicago where the, the Argonne Labs were. And then he would uh, travel from there to Pittsburgh, and then uh, where the uh, Bettis laboratories were for the, uh, where they were building the nuclear reactors. And then he might travel from there to uh, electric boat 
to go see what was going on with the construction of submarines there. And then he would return to Washington and he would take an overnight train in order to arrive in Washington in order to go directly to his office the next day. Uh, he, while he was traveling, he did something he called the pinks. He, uh, he had every bit of correspondence, including drafts that were written by any of the people working in his office every single bit had to have a pink copy. And that pink copy at the end of the day, they were given to him. And he would go through them and mark them up. He would mark up grammatical errors. He would mark up diction errors, but most importantly, he would mark up procedural errors and tell them, this is what's wrong. This is why you cannot do this or why you have to change this. This is what he would do at home. And then in his spare time, he and his wife would get together and they would write books. So uh, this was a man who was occupied all the time. He was working all the time. Uh, there was there, the, he outworked everybody. And they knew at, uh, at Naval Reactors, if they had to work those ungodly hours, they were given opportunity and responsibility by him. And if you didn't want that, this was not the place for you to be and you wouldn't last long. But if you were interested in holding responsibility for some of the most advanced technology in the world, this was a place where you had the chance to do something great. Uh, but the price of that was that you had Rick over at your neck all the time. But people lasted there, the people who, who came to work at Naval Reactors and uh, stayed there for decades. And this despite the fact that they could leave for industry and make salaries many times what they were paid there. They said that he ran the ideal university where all that counted was that you had something intelligent to say and that you could argue for it. Any other questions? Here's one from uh, online from James Lieberman. Uh, is it true that the Admiral required green, green grapes for the boats when he made it to shore? <laughs> okay, so the question was, is it true that the Admiral required green grapes uh, aboard the boats when he came aboard? Um, not only did he require green grapes, he required the entire New York Times bestseller list. All uh, uh, the major uh, publications he required uh, he had, there was a list that would go from ship to ship when he came aboard. It was called a rig for Rickover list. And admirals I've talked to said they've never seen anything like it outside of Rickover. And this uh, Rickover would come aboard. He would, uh, he would expect his stateroom to be set, uh, special foods, uh, uh, personal foods laid out for him, including lemon drops uh, and fresh grapes. Uh, and there, um, there was an element of that you could call abuse of the system there that he, was, that he did engage in. And uh, at the end of his career, uh, further abuse came back and bit him. And uh, you know, when you read the book, you'll, you'll learn about that. It was sort of a, a, a sad and contrary uh, end to, uh, uh, what was otherwise uh, a career of incredible integrity. Yes, sir. Uh, so celebration food tour that you try to send the next one after after you retire. And, and I was oh, uh, after, uh, there was another uh, submarines came to the rescue after a uh, possible munitions. Um, when the Perry Collins got shot down, the UK got shot down, Captain Beach sailed around the world on water. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is, is, that, is that in the book? Or? Um, it, so the question, there are two questions. One uh, was about who was uh, in that photograph when they were uh, christening the, uh, the Rick over. Um, unfortunately, uh, other than he and his wife, I'm not sure I could tell you. I'm sure it's the... Um, you know, that there had to be a, the Secretary of the Navy at that time and um, the, probably the Chief of Naval Operations at that time, but I, I can't tell you who it was. Although I should say that many Chiefs of Naval Operations 
ended up coming from the submarine force. Um, they, the, the, uh, those who did not like their outlook called them the submarine mafia. Um, and then the other question was about the, um, uh, uh, the circumnavigation of the globe by uh, uh, when uh, Ned Beach became captain of the, um, uh, the Washington, I think it was. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, you know, an ex another extraordinary achievement. You had a submarine that literally went uh, around the entire world underwater and was never once detected by any naval force anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, so uh, he he uh, he said for people at home that uh, Admiral uh, Captain Beach. Uh, had hit a, who was uh, the son of a of a important uh, naval officer. And so, yeah. Uh, so uh, Ned Beach is uh, is an interesting, uh, uh, very interesting submarine officer. He was uh, he was uh, a hero during World War II. Did extraordinary things, uh, going into Japanese. Uh, harbors to actually attack ships in port. Um, and he uh, was politically very connected. He was the naval aide uh, to Eisenhower in, in the uh, picture of the christening of the uh, Nautilus, when Mamie Eisenhower is hitting it with champagne bottle. Uh, that's actually Ned Beach right over her shoulder. Ned Beach and Rickover did not get along well. Uh, Rickover looked at somebody like Ned Beach and said, your Navy, your traditional Navy. And uh, at first, Rickover rejected him for command. And eventually he did take him for command. Uh, you're saying, I don't know the uh, story about uh, Beach having a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you said from where, his wife? Uh, that he, uh, he had a wife of Haitian ancestry and that, Okay, and that was a factor in his not making an admiral. Um, I, do, I don't know that story, but I do know from uh, people who knew Ned Beach that he was not a fan of the admirals. Um, there, there is a fictionalized book, uh, a fiction book that he wrote. Um, I'm blanking out on it now. He wrote a number of novels. Yeah, well, there's Run Silent, Run Deep, but there was another book that he wrote and I'm blank about his, uh, based on his career as a nuclear officer in which he describes his interview with Rickover and, uh, and the, the sort of personal confrontation that they had, uh, which was basically based on Rickover saying, oh, you think you're a hero. Uh, you're just, you know, you're just another one of these Navy idiots. And, um, and they went at each other. Or Rickover went after him, and Beach knew to keep his uh, his mouth shut. Eventually, um, he actually uh, wrote some negative opinion articles that ran in the Washington Post. Uh, there, uh, when Rickover fell, there was a sort of mounting chorus saying Rickover's time has passed, and that uh, he uh, he should be uh, should be forcibly retired. Uh, and but I also spoke to a number of people who were working for Rickover at the time, they said they saw no diminishment in his powers. So and there's no question that uh, at 81, you're probably not capable of doing what you could before, uh, but you know we had a president, uh, uh, Reagan at that time, who was in his mid seventies. So hard to say what, uh, when powers diminish. Well, what happens when you wait too long, that the Supreme Court changes Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Um, in the movie Eisenhower, we've got an educated ship and it shows the general dynamics. Can you talk in your book a little bit about Lester Crabtree and the ship of general dynamics? 
Uh, not specifically about less. I'm sorry, less. Um, so the question is whether I, I uh, spoke about in the book, speak about in the book about Lester Crown and uh, the uh, family that owned General Dynamics. So uh, General Dynamics is the parent company of Electric Boat. Electric Boat is the uh, submarine yard. Uh, and uh, I do not specifically talk about Lester Crown. There's quite a bit about uh, Rickover's relationship to Electric Boat. Um, there's a funny story about when he offered the, um, the opportunity to build the, uh, the Nautilus. And he went to a, uh, a Navy yard. The Navy at that time, uh, coming out of World War II, had its own uh, shipyards, uh, as, as well as uh, contracting with private yards. And Rickover went to a, uh, a Navy yard and said, well, do you want to build the world's first uh, nuclear propelled vessel. And there was some, uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, the executive officer there uh, knew Rickover, had bumped heads with him before and said, I don't, I don't want to work with Rickover. And so uh, they said, no. Rickover said, can I borrow your phone? He called up the head of electric boat um, and said, uh, will you take this? Do you want this contract? He said, yes. He said, we'll be right down. Hung up the phone. Uh, drove and that night signed the contract with Electric Boat. Um, but he had his fights with Electric Boat too and, uh, and General Dynamics, uh, including uh, at the, toward the end of his career, uh, things that got very, very ugly. There are a couple of questions online about uh, Rickover's Jewish identity. Uh, Rabbi Sheldon Lewis has, did Admiral Rickover ever talk publicly about his Jewish identity? And we're just about running out of time. So maybe you can answer that together with, uh, you mentioned Rick Over's son, thought he converted. Can you discuss more about what he thought of his father's uh, religious ideas? Okay. So um, I, two questions, Rick Over's uh, Jewish identity and his son's sense of uh, Rick Over's Jewish identity. Um, so um, thanks to uh, Rabbi Bruce Khan here, a, a career Navy chaplain who was the rabbi who officiated at his burial and at his uh, uh, formal Navy memorial service. Uh, Rick Over was a Jew. Rick Over never converted. Uh, he had a Jewish burial. Uh, his, uh, his second wife, widow, Eleanor Rickover, uh, although a devout Catholic herself, uh, said he was a Jew. The, at the end of his life, he uh, was having a book read to him about uh, the, uh, the Jews of Poland, a history of the Jews of Poland. Um, he had a B'nai B'rith award on his mantelpiece. All of this thanks to, uh, to Rabbi Khan. And there's absolutely no question that he identified as a Jew and that he never converted. And yet his son, who was a loosely raised Presbyterian, um, believed that his father had at some point converted. It was just part of Rickover's personal privacy. Um, uh, I should say that his son, Robert, um, has actually converted to Judaism himself. So, um, you know, the, his Jewishness was that he was a student who said uh, all his life, he was a, a man of great learning who brought his learning into everything he did. He was a man of deep humanity. He was also, as he said to one of his aides, uh, as they were driving through the Connecticut countryside one night, you treat a Jew like crap, watch out, he's gonna do something. And he had a chip on his shoulder and that, that he made things happen and he did things. And, uh, you know, we can uh, figure out what that means and think about what that means, negative and positive terms. Uh, Rick Over said at one point, uh, each of us has to live as if the fate of man depended upon us. You know, that comes, is that from uh, uh, Pirkei Avot? 
um, I can't remember, uh, but the sense that each life is responsible for all lives. Uh, Talmudic. Mm -hmm. Talmudic, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a bar mitzvah. He was raised uh, through high school as a Jew. Uh, he could not live as a religious Jew and never did after, uh, after leaving for the Naval Academy. Uh, when he married outside uh, the religion, his parents for a period disowned him. Uh, they never met their grandson. So uh, a very complex, extraordinarily accomplished man, uh, a, man a difficult man, uh, an SOB uh, in the deepest senses of the word, uh, and yet he achieved greatness. So uh, I think we should conclude there. Thank you. Thank you.